All right, so let's review some of the rules of, of classical probability theory, and let's apply them to our new function, psi, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the connections to kind of make this a little bit more clear what this, what this statement really means. So, first of all, if you recall, based on the ideas of classical probability, we had introduced something that we called, instead of for discrete variables, the big probability p of x, for example, we introduce something called the probability density function, rho of x. And that's, so we, again, we call this the probability density. And the reason why we did that, if you recall, instead of selecting like ages, like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, instead, if we allow for the sampling variable x to take on continuous values, we now have a function that you have to think about in a given small range, dx. What is the probability of finding that, that whatever within that range there? So specifically, we said that the probability density function, if you multiply it, if you take rho of x times dx, and you can think of that if you just have a normal well, normal in a, a typical sense, a, a distribution where this is what our row of x is, and if you have some small width dx there, that if you take the area of that little slice compared with the entire area, that's what the probability is. So this right here is the probability of finding the particle within a width dx of point x. Or even just to be a little bit more clear, we could even call this x naught, and the probability of finding it within with dx of point x naught. So it, it, it's sometimes helpful to differentiate a set point versus a continuous variable x there, which is why I'm writing it like that. So Really, all we have to do is relate our wave function, psi, back to this probability density, rho. And the easy way of doing that is, I'm going to erase this here. The easy way of doing that now is, because we had said that it's psi squared, that tells us the probability. That's exactly what we can set equal to rho. So rho of x now simply becomes that psi of x and t squared. And that tells us as well that rho of x dx will simply get turned into, and I'm going to omit the, the parenthesis x and t here just to save room, that will turn into psi squared dx. Um, you know what, and I'm actually going <laughs> to change my mind on that because I want to expand on it just a tad. Um, so if we consider the probability within a range of dx of x naught, like we've just done there, we'll write it like this, x naught comma t squared dx. And I'll write that out kind of exactly how we had before. If now this blue line indicates whatever psi squared is, and if we have a point x naught, I mean, this is precisely what we just did, but I'm just going to turn this into our quantum interpretation now. If you take some small slice dx centered or beginning at x naught, if you take dx as an infinitesimal, it doesn't matter whether you start there or center it there. Um, the point is, we can now interpret this if that blue line is our new probability, our quantum probability function. This, the area of that slice there will tell us how likely we are to find a quantum particle within a width dx of x naught. So it, it's really a pretty straightforward application, except instead of using a nice looking function rho of x, we have to use a more weird looking complex valued squared thing, dx. So let's look at some of the rules for this function psi now, now that we can directly interpret what that probability density is based on psi. 
Okay, so making these connections will now allow us to use the, the rules that we already know to be true for probabilities to put some constraints on what this psi function must, must be like. Um, and, and I'm going to add one right off, the, right off the top that is not related to classical probability theory. So here are some rules that psi must obey. If it is, in fact, to accurately convey a quantum probability distribution. So, in other words, if it's something that is ac acceptable in the quantum realm, it has to obey these types of things. So the first thing I will say is that psi of x and t must solve, or it must be a solution for, the Schrodinger equation. And this is what basically the, the next about four lectures or so is going to be, is solving the Schrodinger equation and seeing what some of the things, some of the solutions actually look like. Um, and so, by the way, we'll see that it is inherently a, a partial differential equation, but we're going we're gonna to make some easy, we're going to make some good assumptions to basically allow us to get actual solutions, and we're going to like analyze these from the ground up. Anyway, more on that later. But from here on out, though, we are going to assume this is true of everything we're working on. So we're going to assume that the functions we've already confirmed do solve the Schrodinger equation. The second thing, because it's a probability distribution, or specifically because it's a probability density, we know that if you take the, the, the total of all the, of all the possible values, it has to add up to one. So that's like saying that, you know, again, sampling all of the students in the class, that if you sample everyone, you're guaranteed that you're going to get one of the ages that, that is allowed. So with this dis distribution in a continuous manner, we know that it, is, it must be normalizable. And I'll expand on that in one moment. So I had used this word last time, normalizable. But mathematically, what that equates to is if you take the integral of our probability distribution, which again, it's psi squared. So the integral across all possible values, that's from negative to positive infinity, um, the integral across all possible values of x of our probability distribution, psi of x t squared dx, it has to add up to 1, or in this case, it has to integrate to 1, I should say. So, we know that, so, interpreting what this means, we've already said that this thing right here is the likelihood of a particle appearing within that, with dx. And if we add up all the possible positions where it might be, we know that one of those will be correct. That, in other words, the combined uh, possibilities must add up to one. The combined probabilities must add up to one. So what this means here, and this is kind of interesting, because if you recall, there's something called, um, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to botch the term here, but I think it's improper integrals from, I think you learned this in a Calculus 2 course. Um, but basically, that's an integral that if you integrate it from negative to positive infinity, that it, it, it approaches zero quickly enough that you get a... Um, a finite answer, basically. It doesn't blow up to infinity. So what this means is that psi, or well, psi squared, must approach zero faster than, if you recall, um, there, there is a limit, and the result is that this function here must be, uh, must be smaller than, uh, what is it, x to the minus one, or one over x that if you integrate 1 over x, and I'll write it like 1 over x. So when it approaches the infinite points, uh, this must approach, it must be smaller than 1 over x, because the integral of that is the logarithm, and as we go to negative and positive infinity, the logarithm does not approach 0. Um, now, the reason why I say that, though, is that uh, basically psi, um, psi squared has to approach that, but psi doesn't necessarily. That we can now, uh, the, the limit for psi itself is not necessarily going to be 1 over x. Um, this is, I'm getting a little bit technical here, but the point is, though, that certain functions that don't drop to 0 faster than this 
will not be allowed because the integral over all space is going to be, it, it doesn't approach a finite value, so it will be non-normalizable. Um, <laughs> I, I apologize to any math majors, so I, I guarantee I'm botching the terminology and, and a little bit of that. So anyway, it must be normalizable. And um, now one thing that's interesting, unlike before when we had the row di uh, distributions, that we had said these can't be negative because a negative probability density doesn't make sense. You can't have a negative 50% chance of something. However, now that we're taking the square of this, and not only the square, but the complex conjugate square, we can allow for psi to be negative, and we can even allow for psi to be imaginary. So there's really no conditions on, on either of those, but the one last remaining condition here is that psi must be continuous. It can have little, like, uh, it can have, like, uh, kinks in it, which is fine, but you, it can't jump all over the place arbitrarily. Um, so, in other words, the, the way to think about this, you can draw it without lifting your pen. And let me just kind of give one example. So, if this is our range x here, one possible value uh, type of function might be 0, 0, 0, and all of a sudden it goes like that, and it goes like this, it could go negative. So it could have kinks like that. And one thing that what we are in fact going to do in some of our first examples is we're going to make what we call and consider a piecewise linear function. Or a piecewise function where we're going to start with a whole bunch of zeros, we're going to attach a new function like this, like a sine function, and then we're going to attach it to another zero function for the rest of infinity. So we do allow for there to be kind of different zones, but the point is that function at the end of one zone here must match up to where it starts at the next zone. So I, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but this condition here is actually really important because it's what's going to allow us to introduce boundary conditions to get a full solution for our function psi in the end. All right, so uh, let's move on a little bit here. Now, it will probably be important to kind of rewatch this after you've gone a little bit further because some of this I am well ahead of myself, but these conditions are gonna be things that we use when we actually solve for various situations.